effect. And I do it through branding, web design, and marketing. And so this is a very important topic for my clients. They're extremely successful. They're very busy. And so if this happens to them, this is something that we want to address and find out what we can do, what course of action we can take. And so, you know, I have met some amazing attorneys lately. And one of them is Ellie Walker of Danielson Legal. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring her out here. Hi, Ellie. Go Hi, ahead. Molly. And so we're, we are live on Facebook, Ellie. So I would love for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Okay, so my name is Ellie Walker. I call myself an intellectual property attorney or a trademark attorney. Um, I spent about 15 years working in big international law firms back in Boston. Um, I worked with clients of various sizes, all different industries, and got quite a lot of experience. And then about a year and a half ago, I decided to changed my practice up and I joined the uh, IP boutique firm of Danielson Legal. Uh, it's been a great platform because um, one, it lets me actually work from anywhere. So now I'm actually located in Portland, Oregon um, and get to you know continue to practice with clients all over the place. Uh, two, I still get to practice with clients of all different sizes um, and really add value and really give more personalized attention I think in more, um, yeah, more customized attention to each individual client. It's really been a great move. Um, so that's- oh, So Ellen, we have a couple people joining us. So I wanna pause you just for a moment, okay? And what we're gonna do is, if you guys are watching this, I see a few people on there. If you could comment in the field and let us know if you have questions for Ellie, that would be great. Also, you know, Facebook loves hearts, so just press that heart button as much as you can. And even if you're watching this on the replay, thank you so much for watching the replay. Please um, chime in with your comments and also press hearts. And then we're going to take a moment to go ahead and share. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So we're going to go ahead and share this with your group. And I'm going to share it to my business page. Okay. And so while if you are watching this on the replay or if you're watching it live, please go ahead and take a moment to share this live feed so that we can get this information out to as many business owners as possible. And it's some really important information. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and continue on. And so Ellie, you're telling us a little bit about your background. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what intellectual property is and what a trademark is? Yeah, so um, I would say first of all, what I help clients with mostly is their trademarks. And a trademark obviously is a, a brand name, a slogan, a um, product name, the name of your company, anything that identifies sort of the business as a source of a product or service. It can be a sound, it can be a color, it can be a shape, um, but the majority of trademarks that I work with tend to be names of companies, names of products and services, logos, and um, then the, the slogans or the taglines that they use. And what I really help businesses do is select their trademarks, clear them, make sure they're safe to use and register, then help them register them, and then enforce them against their parties if needed. Um, so that's the trademark side. There's a few other things I do in terms of licensing, copyright work, our firm also ha handles patents and other technology issues. Um, but um, I know we're talking mostly about trademarks today and that is the focus of my business. So 
if I want to register a trademark for a program or a slogan, do I need to do that separately from registering the trademark for my business? And so every time it's a new trademark? It is. And there's two different things. Registering your business name with the Secretary of State creates your business. But then you also want to register that trademark federally if you're doing business outside of that state or if you have clients outside of that state. I mean, if you're going to use a slow, uh, a name on your website, you're going to be sending product or offering services in various states or even various countries, you really want to make sure you register that brand federally so that you have rights protected throughout the United States. Um, so is a trademark for your business name always separate from your trademark for your logo? No, not necessarily. <laughs> Some people actually combine the name and the logo together and register it as one. Um, it'll always depend case by case basis, but oftentimes it's good to register them separately too because your logo might change over the years, whereas your name may not. And you want to keep that name without having to keep re-registering it each time you change the design of your logo. Um, and same vice versa with the name or logo. Maybe you really like the logo and that stays, but your name might change over the years as you grow or change the direction of your business. So sometimes registering them as separate elements really is the best way to protect you overall, it gives you the broadest protection. Okay. So um, in terms of your advice, do you, do you do that? Do you advise people, okay, you want to register your name and your logo together? You want to do it separate? Or, you know, you, would you let people know, like, what, what to expect? Yes. I mean, I definitely would tell them their options. And it's always going to be a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it might depend on what the trademark is or how strong it is. Or when we search and clear it and see what the rest of the marketplace looks like or how many people have similar registrations. Perhaps we want to register the name with the logo to make it different enough from someone else that they're going to be able to register it. Um, there's always different costs involved. So I will, if you're going to register it separately, you're paying for two registrations at the trademark office versus one. So that's always a business decision that a client needs to make. And we can work together to figure out sort of risk reward, costs, and, and what makes the most sense from a legal standpoint, and then advise them so that they can make the best business decision for themselves. So what kind of clients do you work with? Uh, really clients of all sizes, from individual entrepreneurs, local small businesses, to big Fortune 500 companies. Um, they can be in various industries, like I've done a lot with software and um, technology clients but I've done a lot with um, fashion, uh, food and beverage clients, online retailers, um, medical device, biotechnology, and then even like banks and lending institutions, um, things like that. So really anyone who needs my help. <laughs> and it could be, I mean, the larger companies will have inside counsel like general counsel that I work with. So their needs might be very different from a local small business or an entrepreneur who's just starting a company. Um, I might really have to be that in-house counsel for them. Like I might really have to provide them a lot more information and a lot more guidance. And, um, you know, just, it's a different situation with each, each, each company that I would work with. And that's actually what keeps it interesting and I really enjoy. Okay, so thank you so much for that and for explaining it. And um, can you walk us through that process of how do you select the trademark and get it registered? So clients usually have in mind what they want to use as a trademark. They've already, you know, either just randomly picked a name or they've done research with a branding company and they've come up with a name that they like and they want to go forward with. Or maybe there's two or three names they're choosing among. The first step that I would do with them is do a clearance search, which um, I would search the US Patent and Trademark Office database. And I would also search some other resources, like maybe the Google search engine or some local resources that might matter in that industry. 
And I would see um, if there's any obvious obstacles, like anyone that's already using or has registered the same or something very similar. Um, and I do have clients that come to me and say they've done that searching, but I, I ask them or I kind of do my own anyways, because there's things I know to look for that they wouldn't necessarily know. There's ways to search that I would do that they wouldn't necessarily do. And I also, having the experience with the trademark office would know what might get refused or what the trademark office might find problematic that the client might not know. So it's um, really a good first step before you invest any more time and money into that trademark uh, to do that clearance process. And then from there, if everything looks good, um, we might start the registration process. And did you want to you want to go further on that or? No, oh, just just holding up because um, a few questions come up from that. And so, what do you do if you you see that there's a, a lot of other people with a similar business name? Does that does that person just have no ability to trademark or what, what can they do? Uh, so it'll always depend again on the circumstances of the case, but um, often if a field is very crowded, that might mean that you have your own small piece of the pie that you can have, so to speak, that everyone um, is doing, maybe the marks are just slightly different enough or they're doing something slightly different enough with their businesses and services mm -hmm. that they all can coexist and, and consumers aren't gonna be confused and that the trademark office will allow them all to register their own marks as long as they're different enough. Um, otherwise, if you're really looking for a strong brand that you can really develop a lot of goodwill in and no one has something similar and you wanna clear this great space for yourself, then you probably would select a different mark in that situation. You would probably go a different direction. Um, mm -hmm. Just, you may not want that small, narrow, right, just to exist. You may want something bigger and stronger that you can build. So that's where I can advise. On, um, so is it more dependent on the business name or the mark, or is it is it both kind of getting? It's, it's both. And it's what the client is looking to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's the business name, they tend to want something stronger, something that they can really be unique in. Maybe the same with like a product. Um, sometimes though, with a secondary brand, like a, lo a, a tagline, maybe they don't care if it's somewhat similar to someone else's, as long as they can use the one that they have and no one can stop them, that may be all they want. Uh, they just wanna make sure they're not gonna get in trouble for infringing someone else. So, you know, it can give them the information and then they can make that decision about what they'd like to do. All right, so um, so I had, you know, just kind of like another question, which is, you know, sort of about the registration process. Um, you know, we had talked about it a little bit and then kind of got sidetracked because I know that just find, you know, determining what the trademark is or selecting your trademark is a big process. Um, but before we get into that, I mean, I still have a question about um, selecting the trademark and what are the the most common mistakes that you see being brought, you know, up, you know, that do they come up again and again? Like, oh, can you tell ahead of time, like that's definitely going to be refused or, um, you know, you probably want to change your business name because of this. Are there some guidelines that you can give us to help determine, um, help people select their business names? Yes, and they may be contrary to what you as a marketing professional might tell clients. Um, sometimes trademark law and, and marketing kind of come head to head because with trademarks, from the legal perspective, I'm trying to tell you to pick something as unique as possible, to be as strong of a mark as possible. And what those are, are marks that are really arbitrary or fanciful. So think of um, a made up word, like maybe Kodak is a very strong word, you know, because no one else has it. Or a word like Amazon, which exists, but when you apply it to an online um, retail store, like that has no meaning. There's no relationship between the word Amazon and that. So it's a very strong brand that you can build. Like that's a very strong trademark. Um, ones that are harder to protect and become much more crowded usually in the field are ones that are more descriptive. Like if they're describing 
the nature of the product or the service you're offering. Um, those are ones that the trademark office may not allow you to register or you might have some limitations on your registration. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example, but let's just say Molly Oyua marketing services. You know, your name might be unique, but then marketing services oh. aren't. So I have a question about that. So I actually agree with you. I, I prefer for my clients to have very unique business names. And actually, I advise them to keep it that way if they want to trademark in the future, even if they don't want to trademark right now. Um, so it's really important to me as a marketer that my clients have very strong brands and we're building global brands in in most of the cases. So, you know, we want to really stand out and have something that isn't out there already. That's um, so one of the things I mean, I hear you saying and I see it all the time um, and especially it's it's something I see. And then I think oh, well, they've never talked to an attorney or they've never tried to trademark it because they have a business name that describes exactly what they do, like social media marketing or you know something like that. And so it's definitely something that, yeah, it's really easy because people can understand it. But then at the same time, again, I know that they haven't talked to an attorney that it wouldn't stand the test of time. And it's not necessarily going to be a global brand. So if that's their goal, then you know I need to redirect them. But it, again, it's like what you were saying, it depends on their goal, right? Yeah. Um, so, but you brought up another point, which um, I have a question about, which is I have clients who maybe are using their own name for their business. So what do you do in that case? Can people trademark their own name? They can. Um... I actually have clients that have done that. It happens a lot in the fashion industry or it happens a lot in um, like consulting or educational areas or maybe um, even nutrition, like famous doctors that want to brand their products with their own name, things like that. I've had clients in that space and you can, you can register your own name. Um, which is different from registering just your last name. And I say that because your last name, like what we were talking about with marks that are just descriptive and describe exactly what it is you're doing, are marks that are tend to not gonna be allowed by the trademark office because it they call it primarily merely a surname. And lots of people have that name and they may wanna use it on their business. So they can't sort of take it out of the realm for everyone to use and allow only one person to have exclusive rights. So, um, so your last name, probably not unless you're Sears now and you've built up tons of, you know, uh, goodwill in it over the years and it has now acquired distinctiveness because that actually was a last name to begin with. Um, but your full name, yes. Um, especially again, it would have to go through the same test as any other trademark and be distinctive enough where someone else hasn't already registered something confusingly similar to it you know, on goods and services that are similar to what you're going to be doing. So, okay, so then let's move on to how do we get it registered? Tell us how long that process takes and what we can expect. So, you know, I'm gonna start the process with my company. So what, is, what does that look like? And not me personally as an example, but a business owner, what can they expect? So the first step is defining the goods and services that you want to protect. And that sounds easy, but it's really important. And this is another area where I always want people to work with an attorney because um, you want to get the broadest rights possible, but you also need to be accurate in describing what you do. Or at the end of the day, the registration you get isn't going to be worth anything to you. You want it to cover what you use it on, so that it's valuable, but you also want to try to cover it in a way that allows your business to grow and shift a little, but still be covered by that registration. Um, so I would work with a client to define their goods and services in a way that the trademark office will accept it. And then um, if it's a mark that hasn't been used yet, if it's something they're going to use in the future, but they want to get an application on file now to start preserving their rights, which is something I always recommend to, if you have an idea for a trademark that you might not use for the next six months to a year, 
let's file it now before someone else scoops it up. But um, if it's not in use yet, it's filed based on an intent to use. But if it's something you've been using for some time, then I would work with the client to decide what's an appropriate example or we call it a specimen of use. And when did they start using it in interstate commerce? Because that's a, a date you have to identify for the trademark office. Um, that process tends to take a few hours, several hours, maybe back and forth, it can depend. Uh, and then you uh, file the application. Uh, the trademark office has fees. You have attorney's fees. <laughs> um, but generally to get on file, I would say it's you know a couple thousand dollars. Uh, and then you start having interactive back and forth communications with the trademark office um, to get it in its final form before it can be accepted. And those that process oh, that's, that's not them that's not the business owner having no no no, no. That's you right that's me okay. yeah and that so that's the i mean <laughs> there's different steps along the way um but it tends to be at least a year i mean less than a year is almost unheard of but it's on average i would say 18 to 24 months is often the period of time it would take to get a registration um if it's one you a mark you haven't used yet you can actually extend that time out for quite a while uh, because the mark does have to be in use before they'll give you that final registration in hand. Okay. Um, so I think I would love to get to our big question, which is that, you know, I think somebody's using my logo or my business name or my slogan or whatever it is, and I don't have a trademark. So what rights do I have in that case? Okay. So if you've been using it, because it sounds like you have, if it's someone's using your logo, then you do have rights. You have trademark rights in the US based on just using the brand alone. The limit to that though, is you only have rights in the geographic area in which you've been doing business. So if you've only been doing business in Oregon, then your rights are limited to Oregon. If you've been doing it a few states like California, Nevada, Washington, well, then you have rights in those areas. Um, but this is one of the best reasons I would say to have registered a mark is because when you do, you actually get to protect yourself throughout the United States yeah. beforehand. But okay, so that hasn't happened. Well, you do have rights, like I said, where you've been using it. So someone cannot, someone who comes later, a junior user, will not be able to stop you from continuing to do what you've been doing. Um, however, they can limit you to any sort of expansion. Like you may not be able to go outside of that area if they were there first. Um, if let's say your rights really have extended throughout the United States, you've been doing business everywhere and someone comes along and either registers the mark first before you do, or is using it, like you said in the example, um, there's different approaches you can take and it's always going to be based on the facts, you know, on a case by case basis, you know, who the, who the third person is that's done this, are they a big company? Are they a small company? Um, what industry are you in? Is there something you can work out? Um, but in general, what it is going to take is some fight at the trademark office mm -hmm. to get their registration taken away and then for you to register your own or some sort of litigation in court, which is how you would stop them from using it. Because the trademark office can't stop someone from using, they can only deal with what's at the trademark office. A court is how you would deal with um, use in the marketplace. Um, so I have a situation um, where I have a client who, you know, they've been using their business name and their logo for at least a year. And now there is another company in a different field entirely and a different state who's using the logo. Like it's exactly the same. Wow. So what can they do in that case? They haven't registered yet. Um, this other company hasn't registered. They plan to register, but now they're kind of wondering, are they even eligible? Um, so there's two questions there. One, are they eligible? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, because, well, and it all will come down to, this will actually affect what they can do in general. Are consumers going to be confused into thinking the goods and services between the two companies 
are actually coming from the same source. Like if they see that yeah. logo, completely different, right? If they see the logo used by the other company, are they going to go, Oh, is that related to, you know, company a, if the answer is no, then those two companies should be able to coexist and have the same logo um, from a trademark perspective. Mm. However, the fact that their logo is identical and copied, that could be copyright infringement. I mean, it depends on how unique or how much art, I would say, or originality has gone into the design. Because a logo can also be a piece of art. I mean, it can be a design that someone has created and has copyright rights in. Mm -hmm. So if someone just literally copied that, you know, that's copyright. Yeah. They copied it. <laughs> so it's um, so I may have a referral for you right after this call. I just wanted to I knew I was talking to you about this. So I thought, you know, I'm going to be asking you about this. So I might as well just ask you live and, you know, find out what you'd say about it, because I mean, it's really important. And it's a it's a case that, I, you know, it just came up in the, like the last week. So yeah. it's really relevant and um, it's important, you know, so. For, I mean, an example of where different IP rights actually intersect. I mean, a lot of people will use copyright and patent and trademark to, you know, or maybe even trade secret or combinations to protect their um, intellectual property in different ways. And, you know, so maybe this one can't be through trademark, but maybe there's a copyright issue here. Um, so, yeah. Well, thank you so <laughs> much, Ellie. I mean, this is a lot a lot of information and I know there's a whole lot more that you can share. And so, um, you know, I just really am grateful that you're a resource for us here in the Portland area, but you work throughout the country too, yes. is that right? Yes, correct. And so, law, so I get to work kind of anywhere. <laughs> yeah, and your company is actually based out of Boston, is that correct? Yes, Cambridge, we have an um, office in North Dakota as well in Fargo. Okay. Yeah. And so I know that, I mean, to me, it's just really comfortable being able to ask you these questions that, um, you know, I don't, I just feel like, are they really basic? Um, are they, you know, I kind of ask myself like, well, should I know this? Um, you know, or is it, I throw my hands up and we can't do anything about this. I would rather just be able to ask you. And so, that's why I'm so glad that you're here and that you're on Facebook Live so you can be a resource to other business owners. And so here's where people can find you. Yes. And so we're just putting up the URL, danielsonlegal.com. Ellie is Senior Counsel at Danielson Legal. Where, how long have you been at Danielson Legal? Uh, about a year and a half. A year and a half. Okay. And you've been in this industry for? 17 years. 17 years. Okay. Great. Awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Ellie. And for anybody who's watching this, if you are an expert in your field and you would be a resource to other women business owners, women entrepreneurs and leaders, then please go ahead and go to discoversacredfire.com. I would love to find out more about you and see if we can interview you. And if you are interested in branding, design, and marketing, and you are a woman business owner who is interested in making a big impact in the world, then please go to my website at sacredfirecreative.com. All right. That's it. Anything else? Last words, Ellie? Uh, nope. <laughs> Bye. Bye.